I'm, I'm really uh, hoping you're excited about the course and uh, on all the lectures. Um, <clears throat> I feel remiss because I really wanted to sit in and get to know you all a little bit better. So right now, this is the best I could do. So today, um, I'm going to give a lecture on light and radiometry, kind of a whirlwind tour. <clears throat> So <clears throat> the content of the lecture, and pardon me if I keep clearing my throat, but the content of the lecture is uh, going to go over the radiometric terminology. We covered that uh, in the very first lecture of this class, a little bit uh, and real brief. We're going to go in a little more detail. Uh, we'll talk about the spherical coordinates, coordinate systems, solid angles, and directions. Those are all very important parameters uh, for you to understand. Um, uh, both in radiometric terms, um, but also as you start working with uh, the radiative transfer equation as well. We'll cover radiance and irradiance, um, both going a little more detail into the, what those measurement definitions are, how they're measured, some of the, the key laws of each of them. Um, then we'll talk about the, the types of irradiance as well. There's uh, a variety of different types of uh, radiance, uh, way ra irradiance can get measured. Um, and um, we'll also, uh, also give a very quick hint. Um, Colin's already, I think, talked about this, or somebody did earlier last week about Gershon's Law. And yes, Emmanuel, mm -hmm. it is Gershon's Law, according to Mobley's book. <laughs> um, most of what's taken, uh, most of what's going to be shown in this lecture is uh, all taken from uh, various different sources, some past lectures, other lectures from other content. So. I've uh, tried to give all the credit for some of the figures that I'm going to use to them as uh, where credit's due, but um, it's also a good series of uh, other lectures for you guys to look at too, and 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 because each one of them has a little bit of different detail. So <clears throat> starting back with radiometry, this is where we talked again on the, the first day of lecture, just uh, just on some basic definitions. I put up uh, also the, the figure I showed from Mobley's book uh, as well. Um, it's a really good flow diagram of how all these measurements made or, or are related, I should say. So there's radiant energy. Uh, that's uh, in the uh, units of uh, or joules, and it's um, given with the typically given with the uh, symbol G, uh, Q. Radiant power, which is basically the change in radiant um, energy per time. Um, <clears throat> and then irradiance is the change in the radiant power per change in surface area, incident surface area. Um, now we have to introduce the solid angle. We'll get a little bit more into that. And that's the uh, plane angle concept where we extend this out to three dimensions. By uh, using that solid angle, now we can derive the radiance, which is <clears throat> power per unit area per unit projected solid angle. Oops. So let's talk about angles, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because uh, for me it was always a bit confusing to get all uh, the geometry uh, right, not in the sense of uh, the definition of what those angles are. Um, so let's just start with that. Uh, you'll see the symbol theta, which is uh, the zenith angle or the angle from basically the up and down direction, as opposed to the azimuth angle, which is uh, fine, <clears throat> uh, which goes the 360 degrees around this sphere in a planar sense. Those are the two uh, key angles to remember, and you'll see these uh, used all throughout the terminology in radiative transfer and, and radiometry. However, <clears throat> um, Figuring out how to locate these directions and really understand them uh, can be confusing uh, because like uh, it said here, in radiative transfer, we normally refer to the direction the light is going. Um, but when we measure radiometric quantities, we usually do, do the opposite, the direction of where we point the instruments. So it's always important to know um, where these angles are and where you're, where you're pointing your sensor. 
in an earth frame or remote sensing kind of uh, field measurement sense, we call the sun angle the solar or the solar zenith angle, which is the angle um, off the local zenith that points directly at the position of the sun in the sky um, and the polar coordinate. <clears throat> We also can define the solar azimuth, which is, and shown over here in this lower part of the graph or figure, is uh, pointing uh, directly uh, along the horizon in the plane of the sun. So knowing those two different angles, so if you hear solar zenith, solar azimuth, um, what those are, that's the real definition. You're gonna point at the sun and you're gonna be in the plane of the sun for your azimuth uh, bearing. Uh, you'll also hear this term called the, um, this is the way for everybody. Um, you'll also uh, hear the term nadir angle, which is just basically the opposite direction to the zenith. Zenith going upwards into the sky, nadir meaning uh, coming down to the ground. And so in satellite terms, you'll more often hear the, the nadir uh, uh, definition or the nadir uh, terminology. <clears throat> oh. Oh, moving yet. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about solid uh, angles. Uh, so if we just look at a circle, a flat uh, circle, um, we know how to, from past geometry, you know how to calculate uh, what that angle is uh, with a defined radius, which is basically the arc angle, the length of that arc angle over the uh, <clears throat> the radius. When we extend that to a sphere, this ratio then becomes uh, the ratio of the suspended area uh, on that sphere uh, to the actual uh, square of the radius. And that's measured over four pi ra steradians. Um, as you can see, there's a difference in the, the terminology there. A circle has two pi radians, a sphere has four pi to radians. So if you just look at that definition, you'll see a couple things. Um, <clears throat> one is that the area on this sphere doesn't have to be a normal shape. You just need to know the area somewhere you're looking on the sphere. And then you need to know um, uh, what the radius is, and you can calculate what the solid angle is. Oh, man. So if you <clears throat> um, want an example of this, if you're standing at the center of the Earth and you want to know the so solid angle of the lower 48 states, which is basically uh, needing to know what the surface area um, of the lower 48 states are, which happens to be uh, 8.08 .08 times 10 to the six kilometers squared. And if you know what the radius of the earth is, which is approximately 6,384 um, 6, kilometers, you can easily calculate uh, the solid angle of the lower 48 states, which, tends, which turns out to be about um, 0.198 steradians. So let's set up some spherical coordinate systems here um, and then look a little get, uh, look back again at the solid angle. So again, we're setting up a 3D uh, plane here, three D dimensions here, X, Y, and Z, um, with Z going in the uh, vertical direction and X and Y in the two horizontal directions. And so we set up some unit vectors, and then just by simple uh, <clears throat> geometry and trigonometry here, we can easily um, start understanding the distances of all these different planes um, <clears throat> by using right angles. And so what you see, you can define this unit vector um, in terms of these different angles, sine theta, cosine phi, uh, of x plus sine theta sine phi of y plus cosine theta of z. <clears throat> Why is this important? Because when we get into the radiative transfer part of this, the solid angle uh, is usually defined by discretizing the area, the surface area, 
in terms of the changes in the zenith and azimuth angles uh, by trying to uh, discretize those in very tiny, small quantities such that the solid angle becomes um, sine theta, d theta, d phi. I hope that makes sense at this point. So let's then <clears throat> talk a little bit more about radiance. Uh, radiance is really the fundamental uh, quantity in radiative transfer. Uh, it's defined again as the radiant flux. You'll see this, the change um, in the energy per time uh, per given solid angle, which is here, and per projected area. And it's usually in watts per meter squared per stradians, and um, usually you discretize in terms of uh, wavelength as well uh, per nanometer. <clears throat> As you can see, it is the fundamental quality or quantity in the uh, radiative transfer equation where you have the cosine of the theta angle mm -hmm. is the change in radiance over depth um, is equal to uh, oop, no, is equal to the <clears throat> negative of the beam attenuation times the radiance plus uh, the double integral of the radiance times the backscattering coefficient sine theta d theta d phi, depending on the directions. So theoretically, uh, you can use this equation then to derive the IOPs from uh, the radiance distributions. One thing to note, um, if there was no absorption or scattering, what would this equation be? Zero, meaning the change in the radiance with the change in distance or depth would be zero because now you've got C equal to zero, you've got beta equal to zero, um, all that becomes identically zero. So the change in radiance with distance is zero. What does that imply? We'll get into this. It really implies a principle of radiance invariance. It's a key principle. That, that would only be for plane parallel. Correct. Distance. Correct, in a plane parallel condition, yes. So what does a um, radio, radiance measurement device look like? Again, I put back up the, uh, the, the basic definition. Here's a picture of what this uh, sensor looked like. Um, we talked a little bit about before this, I think throughout the class, this is defined as a Gershon tube. Basically what you're trying to do here is you've got an aperture out in the front of the instrument <clears throat> that's uh, of a defined length. And then that is uh, baffled, that light is baffled and it comes down to a diffuser plate. Um, and that, that diffuser then uh, basically tries to homogenize the light enough to, to come back on the out, outside, backside through a filter and into a detector. This, is, uh, this design produces very well collimated light, which is an important aspect of trying to measure radiance. And it defines this aperture helps to define uh, the solid angle as well, as well as the distance from uh, the filter or that first front facing piece. Many of examples of really well collimated uh, radiometers that exist, uh, the Hubble uh, Space Telescope, mm -hmm. Uh, radio telescopes, mini digital cameras, the ones in your phone are pretty good uh, radiometers as well as your own human eye is a pretty good radiometer as well. Um, um, it's a well, well, well collimated radiometer. So I talked about the invariance of radiance again in plane parallel with the absence of absorption and scattering. Uh, it basically says that with distance, the radiance is invariant. It stays constant. It's not a surprising result, uh, but 
Uh, it's one that I wanted to bring up here because it is important in the next lecture, we'll talk about um, calibrating uh, radiant sensors. And uh, in, in practice, when we do these calibrations, um, you are relying on the invariance of radiance to some degree as part of the calibration process. There's another law, um, the n squared law of radiance. It's the radiance invariance between two media with different index of refractions. So we know Snell's law, index of refraction uh, of media one times the sine of the angle coming in um, to that uh, boundary surface. Uh, is equal to uh, the index refraction of media two times the new sine angle that's coming into the uh, media. So <clears throat> for a light beam that's crossing this interface between these two medias, which have different index or refractions, the ratio of the radiance to the square of the refractive index of the media remains invariant when, invariant when ignoring reflective losses. That's this law right here, basically, that uh, the radiance coming out on this uh, new index refraction mm -hmm. side is equal to the radiance times the uh, square of the index refraction on uh, media two divided by the square of the index refraction of media one. Um, of course, this assumes there's no reflective losses. That's what this is, is that there is some uh, boundary loss uh, across that um, surface, which is always the case in the ocean. We always have reflective losses there. But it's important to note that uh, two things and why that is two things are what two things are happening, both the angle um, of, uh, of the light uh, is changing as well as the solid angle. Um, and that's, uh, that's, keep that in mind because as you go through these boundaries, you will see a change in the, uh, uh, the, the, um, sorry, you will see the change in the solid angle, um, um and the angle of incidence, um, So still on radiance, uh, give you a couple little quick graphs. I'm sure you've seen uh, many, many of these, or most of you have seen many, many of these. Here's a, a picture of upwelled radiance um, <clears throat> versus wavelength, um, various depths, and the colors going from the surface down to, I think, about 30 meters here in this graph. So you can see um, <clears throat> It's actually the upwelled radiance. So as you're, <laughs> it's increasing as you get towards the surface. Um, <clears throat> you can see a couple of things in here. Um, a little hump right here around the 650s or 676 uh, peak area. This is a profile of uh, uh, five different wavelengths, uh, radiance, upwelled radiance as well with depth. And you can see the, the changes in these um, are all very different um, across each of these different wavelengths going from 340 to 665 nanometers. And they all have different shapes, uh, particularly in the surface waters. Um, note the, the, the really rapid um, <coughs> change in the red wavelengths as you get near the surface and a very steep change. Um, um, throughout that, that first few upper meters. So just reiterating, if we measured the full radiance distribution, so radiance coming from all directions and as a function of depth and as a function of uh, spectrum or color of the light, we have all we really need for radiative transfer. Um, so as the radiative transfer equation shows, however, um, that the radiance measurements are very dependent on lumin illumination conditions. Where's the solar 
uh, ele sun, sun elevation, where is it in the sky as mutually as well as in uh, elevation and um, above the Earth's surface. It's also depend on cloudiness, obviously, atmospheric constituents, air sea surface properties, um, a whole bunch of things are dependent on it. The most common radiant sensors that are commercially available typically use what I what I talked about the Gershon uh, tube design to measure radiance over a very uh, narrow field of view or solid angle. And we'll get more into this in the second um, section here, but um, it is good to remember when you're uh, using a radiometer, you always need to know the field of view, which defines uh, the solid angle of the instrument. Um, however, obtaining full spectral and full radiance distribution measurements is quite challenging. Uh, only a, a few of these instruments, handful of these instruments have ever been created, and they are very complex and expensive to create. Um, most typically, what we measure is the upwelling radiance at Nader. Um, uh, <clears throat> the LU um, above water measurements, we typically use ones that look at both the sea surface and the sky, or maybe even the sun. So why do we use these measurements of radiance? Uh, they're very good for optical closure uh, studies. I uh, just showed this, if you knew this whole radiance distribution, you could uh, do a lot of optical closure between the radiance measurements and or the yeah, radiance measurements and the IOPs. Uh, for We also need this to vicariously calibrate ocean color sensors. Talk later this week, we'll go over that a little bit more. Why do we do this? Because essentially um, ocean color radiometers measure radiance. That is the unit of measure. And to also use uh, radiance to help validate some uh, ocean color uh, data products as well. I haven't talked this much in a few days, so. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so a quick spin through the radius distribution measurements. Uh, excuse me. Uh, the first underwater radiance measurement um, uh, was done many, 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 many years ago, and it created a, a very inter uh, interesting device that um, essentially rotated uh, a radiance sensor both uh, horizontally and vertically uh, as much as they could across the full uh, four pi uh, area. <clears throat> Um, these are some early data here. This is plotting the um, zenith angle or um, the theta angle uh, versus the actual radiance. And this is uh, uh, measurements, uh, the radiance values um, at one depth here. And so you can, and at, at multiple depths, they did this. So this is surface going deeper. Um, and this is the. Um, <clears throat> Uh, upwelled radiance distributions. These are the downwelled radiance distributions. So you can see in this figure um, uh, the surface. Um, you can see where the sky, the sun is in the surface, um, at least uh, through the different uh, zenith angles. And as you go deeper and deeper um, um, into the water column, that downwelling uh, radiance um, uh, becomes more uniform across all the different uh, angles and is more centered on the zero degree angle. You see in the upwell radiance, um, pretty much that same figure, there's not a whole lot of shifting. Everything's typically around zero degree uh, zenith angle. So measuring radiance, like I said, is difficult. There's been a handful of different ways to do this. You'll hear a term called a fisheye lens, and that's kind of what this is. And if you remember back to, oh, last Tuesday's uh, lab section, you got to play with a lot of these different kind of lenses. Um, but that's what this uh, is showing. This is a fisheye lens and how it sort of works. You've got a series of different lenses, and basically what they're trying to do 
is um, capture different angles. Oh shoot, different angles of uh, the light coming into this fisheye lens, uh, and and then spreading them back out into a filter and to a array that can measure by angle. So it is a very complex piece of uh, optical equipment. It's very hard to maintain. It's very hard to characterize uh, for all the angularity. But um, there have been a handful of these systems created, and they produce some amazing images of the radiance distribution underwater. I'm just going to show a couple of them very quick. Um, these are from Marlon Lewis. Uh, it's Atlantic from a long time ago as well. Here we are in a lithotrophic uh, ocean environment, Hawaii, on a very clear sky day. Again, we're looking at the downwelling radiance distribution and the upwelled radiance, upwelling radiance distribution. So we're looking across the full uh, 4D uh, dimension here and also going out um, uh, po polar wise in terms of angle. So again, what you can see is the downwelling uh, radiance field. You can definitely see where the sun is in the sky. And that uh, tends to, as you go deeper and deeper, it tends to get more to the, the zero degree, zero zenith degree angle, but it's still pretty visible in these clear waters, even at 48 meters. Then from the upwelled radiance, <laughs> you see uh, a much more homogeneous light field throughout uh, the system. There is a little more uh, peaking as you get up towards the surface, to, towards the zero zenith angle, but it it's pretty much more homogeneous across the, or, heter or homogeneous across the, um, uh, the light field. We can contrast that with a much more eutrophic environment like Bedford Basin in Nova Scotia, where we've got lots of chlorophyll particles, all kinds of things absorbing and scattering substances in the water. Now what you see, not surprisingly, is that at the surface in the downwelling, you can kind of see a little fuzzy paint image of, of where the sun is. It's going to spread out. Um, but as soon as you get deeper and deeper, um, you still see uh, more of the intense circle, the Snell's mm -hmm. circle in, in the image, uh, but it's much more, uh, can't see the sun in the, uh, the position as, as much. And again, this is due to the particles, uh, uh, both the particles and the absorption uh, um, uh, in the materials, but um, the scattering is, is tending to diffuse the light out a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a second. It was a very quick whirlwind tour of um, radiance distributions. Okay, so... <clears throat> Let's talk about irradiance. It's a very useful and a very common measurement. Um, it tends to be, as we'll get into a second, uh, somewhat of an easier instrument to make, um, but um, <clears throat> it has also been used uh, uh, um, for a, a, a variety of different purposes. Um, <clears throat> the important thing here is they do not depend on the directionality of the light conditions as much. Like radiance, we need to know where all the angles were. Mm -hmm. In irradiance, um, we're trying to collect light from all different directions. There are several ways to measure irradiance. Uh, there's what's called a spectral plane irradiance, uh, spectral scalar irradiance, spectral vector irradiance, and even photosynthetically active radiation or a PAR sensor. Um, <clears throat> I've highlighted these over here. You can see some of the symbols in the terminology. Uh, we typically call uh, scalar radiance E, lowercase zero, or sub, sub, sub set, sub, subscript to zero, sorry. Um, you can measure both um, the planar radiance and scalar radiance in both the up and down directions as well. Um, so why do we make these radiance measurements? Uh, one, one thing, one reason is to normalize radiance measurements to the illumination conditions. 
So as you're making a upweld radiance measurement um, and then you know, a cloud comes over during your profiler or during your time series, mm -hmm. you want to be able to normalize those uh, the, the radiance values to some incident light -like condition. Um, <clears throat> it's also used to be a, a, a measurement of the light available to phytoplankton for sort of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. As you'll see tomorrow, it's uh, very useful to drive a lot of apparent optical properties uh, from the irradiance measurements. And it's also used to uh, compute uh, remote sensing reflectance parameters. We'll talk about that um, as well this week. And to drive or to try to estimate the IOPs through inversion. <clears throat> uh what's this one? Oh, if this is the uh point with the uh, radiance um so you think about this and this is pretty lights coming out from a point source equally in all directions uh and onto a sphere. And as you think about uh, trying to measure on a sphere um uh, uh, what that radiance is, uh, if you think about that, the farther away you are from that sphere, the more that light's spreading out over a larger and larger and larger surface area. So the amount of light coming out is conserved, but the amount of light um, hitting a planar surface uh, does decrease as the um, inverse of the square law of radiance, meaning a radiance from an ideal point or an ideal point source falls off uh, roughly as a function of one over the distance squared. Again, I'm bringing this one back up because uh, to the next lecture we'll talk about calibration and it's important to remember those two different laws uh, of irradiance and irradiance, particularly when you're trying to calibrate the uh, radi radiometers. So, We'll start, oops, sorry, we'll start with spectral plane irradiance. Uh, <clears throat> that is uh, the change in the energy per time or the, the power per surface area per nanometer or per area per nanometer, incident uh, surface area per nanometer. So here's a diagram of <clears throat> one uh, con a common configuration for a uh, plane irradiant sensor. You use a diffuser to try to collect light from all angles and um, plus or minus 90 degrees off of uh, the zenith or nadir direction. <clears throat> that light uh, then goes through the diffuser, is collected, goes through the filter um, and to a detector. So um, again, another way to write uh, the downwelling irradiance uh, definition is to go from two pi over the azimuth angle and one over pi, or sorry, one half pi, geez, one half pi, zero to one half pi <coughs> in the zenith direction. So you're only looking at the upper half, uh, one half of the hemisphere. And that is the radiance times the uh, absolute value of the cosine theta, sine theta, d theta, d phi. Should be d <laughs> sine v? Sorry? Cosine theta, sine theta? One of those should be v? V? It's there. It's the d theta, d phi right now. But the cosine and the sine are both on theta? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry, right, I couldn't hear your question. Yes, and the reason oh geez. No. Oh, this is wrong. That's right. The omega is sine theta d theta d phi, but the cosine is scaling the radiance right. to the vertical component that's incident on the cosine sensor. Right. And you're going to sketch it really quick on the board here. That would be great. Yeah. So I'm sketching a cosine sensor and I'm sketching um, radiance coming in at an angle. 
and you can break that vector into a vertical component, right? And a horizontal component, right? Does that make sense? So um, how much of this radiance is going to intersect the, the cosine sensor? None, because they're parallel, right? So that doesn't, that part, that portion of the, of the radiance is not going to be detected by your cosine, which are what, what you can collect is the vertical component of that. And so that is the cosine of the angle. The cosine of that angle is that vertical component. And so that's where the cosine comes in in that integration. And sine theta d theta d phi is just the um, integration from zero to pi over two in the vertical, and then from all azimuth angles, which is two pi, okay? That's the D phi. That's the D phi, okay? Yeah. Okay, we're good. There's just before, Andrew, there's another way to, to show the cosine effect. And this is simply by the spread, here's, my dot. And now all I'm going to do is just move the angle and you see how I'm spreading the light over a much bigger. So per unit area, there's much less light even. And it goes down like a ghost. This is this letter. The same as I did here. Yeah. So yeah. just playing with lasers, we're all good. <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> the the ideal diffuser, or what we call a cosine collector, is um, is a light collection surface uh, that is equally sensitive to light from basically any direction. And um, like I said, in a uh, uh, plane irradiance, you want to be able to to, to measure the light from zero <clears throat> in theta all the way to ninety in theta. The difficult to do in the sensor, you also have surface reflections you need to think about and, and all kinds of different things off your sensor face that are getting in and angles. And so um, these cosine collectors are um, a critical part of the measurement system. And depending on whether they're in the air or used in the air or the water, um, uh, how these uh, cosine collector surfaces marry up in the sensor uh, will vary a little bit. I think this is what a manual I couldn't see, I was trying to show, but um, again, if you look at a flat surface and you use this, your, your vantage point of where you are here, um, you see what happens is that it looks like a circle straight down and as you move up and over it becomes flatter and flatter in, in, in sort of your, your eye perspective. And so well, there is a cosine effect on how that light is hitting uh, the, the surface of the vertical or of the, the detection surface. Um, <clears throat> Here are some uh, different plots. Um, you probably have seen a lot of these in terms of the downwelling uh, irradiance. Uh, and I think this is Hawaii as well, uh, spectrally over many, many uh, diff different depths, 1, 10, 21, 26 meters. And you can see the, the, <clears throat> the right above the surface, it looks very much like what we saw before in terms of uh, the spectrum, the solar spectrum hitting the Earth's surface. But that gets changed really rapidly as we run into particles and scattering um, and then of the water um, and the absorbed uh, components of the water itself, removing a lot of that red light very, very quickly. Um, and then as it gets reflected back up, it has to get uh, removed as well or added back in. It's another uh, picture from a green water station. Mm -hmm point that I want to show here is just if you flick back and forth, <laughs> uh, the uh, the uh, ED spectrum does change um, very much so as, as we'd expect uh, based on the composition of the materials in the water.
Um, <clears throat> the next measurement type is the scalar irradiance. And this is using a spherical surface to collect the light from um, all directions and bring that to a collection point that's ideally at the center of this um, diffuser sphere. So we're, now we're taking that planar diffuser and making it a, a sphere. So in this case, um, the cosine factor drops out. Because now we're trying, we don't really care what they, they, the, what's hitting the planar surface. We're trying to collect the light from all angles across this spherical surface. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the sorry, um, ways that uh, uh, PAR is measured. You can do this either uh, by sticking on a stock, sort of not sticking a stock, but sticking on a, a absorbing surface and looking at the uh, scalar radiance in the downward direction or upward directions by flipping that sensor up and down. Or ideally, you could stick this on a very, very, this big sphere on a very tall, skinny stalk and measure uh, the aspect, scalar radiance from all directions up and down both half hemispheres. So, um, the detector has the same effective area for radiance in any downward direction, um, in this case, for example, and thus there's no cosine factor on the L, on the radiance. A uh, couple more here, spectral vector radiance is simply just the difference between the planar downwelling irradiance minus the upwelled planar irradiance. It's often described as the net downward irradiance. And so <clears throat> what can you do with these measurements? Well, there is a law called Gershon's law where the change in the net downward uh, irradiance is equal to the negative absorption times the scalar irradiance. So that's another way you can derive an IOP just uh, dir directly from uh, uh, radiance measurements um, that you can make with sensors available. So the last one is uh, PAR, uh, um, the photosynthetically uh, available radiation. And it's essentially the integral over wavelength from 400 to 700 nanometers of the scalar irradiance. Um, um, <coughs> However, typically, because these are usually used to try to understand uh, phytoplankton growth models, uh, primary production, we need to scale that, change the units um, to go from the radiometric energy units um, and flux units to um, uh, photons. So that's where the wavelength over... <coughs> Uh, HC comes into play here is to convert from um, the energy uh, into photons. There's various different versions of PAR sensors. Some, some use a scalar irradiance design, which I just showed uh, more of like the, the golf ball on a stick. Uh, versus uh, uh, there are some also plain irradiance uh, versions that do exist, um, which those come to the, their own set of assumptions as well. And I think uh, that's what I'm ending up with today. I hope that was helpful and meaningful and I uh, uh, leave you with one of the things that I love to do when I go around is look for uh, Snell circles, Gershon tubes, and so I have a whole bevy of these pictures on my phone. <laughs> Thank you all. What's the photo on the right of? Uh, this is in uh, Kew Gardens in um, England. It's uh, It's like they call it a bee's nest. And so it is a, a piece of artwork, basically, um, to um, collect a lot and reverberate a lot of sound. So it's this sort of sound tunnel. tunnel. So they, they have this hive, the sound of a hive humming. And if you walk out underneath this or around it, 
this is like just a big giant echo chamber for noise and, and sound. And a Gershon tube. <laughs> and a Gershon tube, <laughs> appropriated. Excellent. Thank you. Take a half an hour. Could we take, what's our break, Emmanuel? Half an hour. Take a half an hour break for your voice. Yes, okay. okay, and we'll be back. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Should I stop the recording or pause it? I can't stop it. Yeah, I guess so.